How have you not seen that yet? Congratulations. Thank you. Start from the beginning. Tell us everything. Okay. So I can't believe it. What is it? You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> That's great. Hey, come here. You gotta listen to the story. I have something to show you. First, we, we gotta tell her mom something. Your mom or my mom? Peter, John, come see this. The tomb. It's empty. So the good news is that the tomb is empty, that Jesus really is alive, uh, that he has resurrected for us, and that we have victory because of that. You just sang about that just a little bit ago, which we praise God for that. Listen, if you're watching online, we welcome you here uh, into our discussion today. If you're in the parking lot, there we go. I heard him out there to honking. And for those of you who are in person, we are so glad that you're here with us today. Uh, I remember a few um, uh, a while back when we didn't quite have this. Uh, we'll talk about that here in just a second. So it's exciting for us to all be together today in some way, shape, or form. I didn't realize this is spring break for many people. So we got some people watching online, uh, maybe even in the cars or driving. Just make sure you keep your eyes on the road. So hey, before we get started, a couple of things. It's a neat, new little new neat little tool that's new to us, and we want to share it with you. Uh, because last week we got a really good response with this. But um, just as a quick reminder for all of you uh, to let you know that we have people standing by to pray. Uh, and so uh, last week we sent out a text using a certain service called Thrive. And many of you responded with some prayer requests. And so we got a tremendous number of responses from that text that got sent out. Many of you texted back in, either whether it was you online or you here in person. Uh, and so people asked for prayer from tons of different things, from vision loss, for healing, for a variety of physical ailments, from cancer to kidney disease, uh, patients in dealing with family members, business issues, and just kind of navigating all the ups and downs of life, uh, prayer for marriages and restoration. And so we just want to remind you that that is there. We have a, a group that we call the 70 Strong Prayer Group. And so Everybody on a prayer list gets prayed for, and so you can do it in a couple of different ways. You can do it the old school way, like in, if you got if you grabbed a bulletin on your way in. Uh, some of you may be going like, "What's a bulletin? What is that now? We don't even know what that is yeah, on the other side of COVID." But inside that bulletin, there is a card you can actually fill out your prayer request and actually write that out. Or if you get your phones out, you can text this number, uh, and it's uh, it'll be up on the screen here. It's eight three three four five nine zero six zero seven. And when you fill, when you, uh, there you go, there it is right there. So you can text uh, any kind of prayer request to that number. That gets to us, and then that gets filtered out to our prayer group. And we have people praying for those things. So we encourage you that if you've got prayer requests, even now, uh, pull your phone out and start texting away on that. Let us know about that. We want to know about that. So last year, Easter was a whole lot different than it is this year. Uh, it's incredible. I got to thinking about this. Uh, in the room, we, we were um, obviously like most, most places, most churches, we were not meeting in person. 
Um, we had to vacate Parkview High School, and so we were in the studio about a year ago this time. Uh, in the studio, it was Carrie uh, behind all the computers like she is right now. Uh, we had uh, Landon, my son, on a camera. Melinda was on a camera. Will was in the room. I was in the room, and we were doing Easter Sunday like that. And many of you probably remember that we had technical issues. Maybe you're a little frustrated on the other side of Facebook or YouTube going, Urgh, I can't get this to work. How come I can't hear you? What's, what's going on over there? Uh, and what was happening was... Was we were on the same digital platform that all the other churches were on, and so we were all having issues uh, on those Sundays. And I am so glad that we don't have to worry about that. That we're here uh, in person together. We had a first service just a little bit ago, uh, which was great to have. And uh, of course, we got the parking lot going outside, and you online as well. And so uh, I am so glad that we are back together with one another in many ways on Easter. So yeah, absolutely, praise God for that. So we're gonna we're launching today. We're actually launching a new sermon series uh, that um, we're calling Oscar Mike, a church on the move. Now you see that you may go, okay. So hang on, Art. Right. Who's Oscar and who's Mike and why are they in your sermon series? And so you may if you if you're wondering that right now, going, what does that actually mean? Well, Oscar Mike is a military jargon or tactical speak for on the move on the move. And so maybe you've heard this phrase, maybe in a movie, uh, or maybe someone had texted it to you or whatever, in conversation, maybe you heard someone use that term before. I don't know, I don't know if Jesus used it or not. I'm not sure if Jesus back in his day would have actually have used this phrase himself for the church, but essentially this is what Jesus is saying to all of us in Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says, therefore, go. Therefore, go. You see, we are to be a church that is Oscar Mike, on the move. A church that is on the move, sharing the good news of the resurrection of Jesus. And this is what we want to be. As a church, we want, we want to reach the one who's lost in our world, in our community. We want to be a church that is on the move. And I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you, when I think about uh, Easter and I think about uh, um, myself in the past, even as a minister in some ways, when I think about Easter time, I often, I often don't necessarily, fo I didn't often necessarily, I do now, but I didn't then often focus on the resurrection. And when you think about the fact of uh, the weekend, right, we had Good Friday, which celebrates, the, celebrates the, the crucifixion of Jesus. And some may go, why is that even good? Well, it's because it wasn't good for Jesus, obviously. But it's really good for us, right? Because he took our sins to the cross. And I tended to think more about the death and the crucifixion of Jesus than I, than I really did about the resurrection. And I got to thinking about why did I do that? Why would I seem to steer my attention more towards the death of Jesus rather than the resurrection of Jesus? And I think a part of it is the fact that I could wrap my brain around the crucifixion, right? Maybe it's because of the paintings I've seen uh, or uh, the, you know, the stories. Matthew, in the book of Matthew... This describes great, in great detail the crucifixion. And so we get a chance to kind of see that and see what that looks like. And if you've ever seen The Passion of the Christ, well, you know, there you go. It's, I mean, it's all about that. And so I tended to focus more on that. I guess in some strange way, uh, I, could, I could really kind of lean into and really kind of uh, relate, I guess, in some ways to the crucifixion of Jesus. Because I've, I'm a sinner, right? Saved by grace. And so therefore, my sins put Jesus on that cross. And I could kind of understand that a little bit. I could wrap my brain around that. But the resurrection was a little tough. I guess in some ways, and it's going to sound weird, but the death, uh, the death of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus was, it seemed to me, even though death may not seem natural, it was more natural. And the resurrection, well, that seemed a little bit more supernatural. And that was hard for me to wrap my brain around that Jesus rose from the, the dead. Even though I knew it, I knew that he did. And I know both those things are important. And I'm not saying the death of Jesus is not important. It absolutely is important. It is important that our sins are taken to the cross and nailed there, right? We, 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 that's an important piece. But today, as we think about the resurrection of Jesus, I want you to think about this. For the first century hearer, for the person way back in Jesus' day, it wasn't the crucif crucifixion of Jesus that drew them uh, to Jesus. It was the resurrection of Jesus that drew them to Christianity. It was the resurrection of Jesus that caught their attention. 
They had, they had all seen or had at least heard about people that had been crucified by the Romans. That, that, was, that was kind of not necessarily common everyday type stuff, but they had seen that kind of thing before. But who had ever heard of anybody resurrecting from the dead prior to Jesus? Who had ever heard of that before? And so the resurrection of Jesus is a game changer. It's a, it was a game changer for everyone back in those days, and it's a game changer for us. In fact, people became followers of Jesus based solely on eyewitness accounts of people that said, no, 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 I saw Jesus. He was on the cross, he died, and no one walks away from a Roman cross. I'm convinced that's why Jesus died the way he did, because it was for sure he was dead. And nobody walks away from that. So people are saying, no, no, I saw Jesus. Other people are going, no, no, I heard Jesus. I was in the crowd, not only saw him, but I heard him speak. Others are going, no, listen, I, I touched. I touched his hands. I touched the nail marks. I know that that was Jesus. And other people said, hey, listen, I watched him eat. He ate some fish. And no ghost eats fish. And so people were, eyewitness accounts, people were coming to Jesus based solely on those accounts that they had seen Jesus resurrect from the dead. And the Apostle Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 3. He says, For what I received, I pass on to you as first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas. Will, when he read this in his opening uh, address to all of us, his out announcements, he said this, was, this is the Apostle Peter right here. This is the Aramaic uh, term for the Apostle Peter. And then it says, then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500. Think about that. More than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living. In other words, you can go back and you can go ask them if you want to. He says, though some have fallen asleep, some have passed away. And then he appeared to James, that's the half-brother of Jesus, who at the time when Paul was writing this letter was the leader of the, of the church in Jerusalem. And then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared also to me as one abnormally born. Here's what the resurrection teaches us. It teaches us that God cannot be stopped. God cannot be stopped. The one thing that stops us Dead in our tracks, pun intended. The one thing that stops us in our tracks could not stop Jesus. You see, God is unstoppable. Death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't keep him. And here's the thing. If God is unstoppable, think about this. Lean into this. If God is unstoppable, then so is his church. So is his church. In fact middle, maybe three-quarters of the way through ministry, Jesus sits around with his disciples and says, who do people say that I am? Apostle Peter raises his hand. He says, what do you got, Peter? He says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, my Lord and Savior. And he says this, Jesus says this, he says, I tell you that you are Peter, and Peter's name meant rock. But he says, on this rock, thinking of himself, on his body, on what he was about to do, he says, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You see, a resurrected Jesus is the rock on which his church is built. And so today, today as we do every Sunday, and maybe we should say as Christians, as we do or should do every day, we celebrate a risen Savior. That's why the resurrection is so important for all of us. So what I'm going to do in just a little bit of time that we have together today is I want to kind of track the movements of our unstoppable God. All the way from Saturday before Palm Sunday to Easter Sundays, we call it, or Resurrection Sundays, I like to call it, because our God is Oscar Mike. He was Oscar Mike 2,000 years ago for us, and he's on the move even now for each and every one of us. And I want us to track his movement. So it's Saturday. It's Saturday night, and dinner is being given in, an, in honor of Jesus. Because a few days before, Jesus had raised a friend of his by the name of Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus had been dead for four days. He was in the tomb. In fact, his sister says, don't open the tomb because 
There's probably a smell that's about to emanate from that. Jesus rose him from the dead. This would be a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do for all of us. And so that Saturday night, Mary and Martha are throwing a huge dinner party for Jesus. And it's in the middle of that party, it's in the middle of of, of what is going on, that Mary takes about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, John says in chapter 12, verse 3. And she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Judas Iscariot objects. His heart and his attentions are exposed. And Jesus says to him, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will, not always have, or you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And with those words, Jesus ever so slightly reveals his plan that he and the Father had previously set up many, many years ago, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. And Jesus is Oscar Mike. Jesus is on the move, heading resolutely toward the cross and the empty tomb. It's Sunday, the next day, Palm Sunday as we call it. We celebrated that last Sunday. The triumphal entry, if you will, of Jesus into Jerusalem. The crowd is excited, sparked by all the miracles, but in particular, out in front is the miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead. That caused a huge buzz all around in Jerusalem and in in the surrounding areas. And so the crowds of people line up to meet Jesus, and they line up with palm branches in their hands. Because back in those days, those days, palm branches were often used to celebrate victories. People would often line the roads and, and wave palm branches and throw them down for a victorious army that was returning or a victorious king that was coming. And so here, Jesus enters Jerusalem victorious, victorious. And the people, as Jesus is, is riding in on this donkey, are shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. And so Jesus rides towards the cross on a donkey. He rides towards the empty tomb on a donkey, fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. But he also comes as a king of peace. You see, that's what a king riding on a donkey symbolized. If he had ridden on a horse, it would have meant that he's there for war and battle. But he comes on a donkey. But there's more here than meets the eye. There's more more to this whole donkey uh, riding thing that meets the eye. Because Jesus, Jesus is on the move to bring peace. Not just to the city of Jerusalem, but to bring peace to us, between us and God. He's here to bring peace between all of us, and, and, and the Father that is in heaven. In fact, Isaiah 53, verse 5, simply says this, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. But not everyone was excited Not everyone was holding a palm branch. Not everyone was celebrating. The religious leaders looked for a way to kill Jesus. In fact, writer Russ Ramsey puts it this way. If Jerusalem was a beehive, with his his triumphal entry, Jesus had hit it with a stick. You could hear the buzz grow as the anger within got organized. His kingly arrival was a strong declaration about his authority over all the conventions of man. But none of this surprised Jesus. He knew this would happen. This is Jesus. He's on the move for us. He's heading decisively to the cross and the empty tomb for you and for me. It's Monday. It's Monday. Many experts believe that this is the day that Jesus cleanses the temple. The temple had become more of a money-making operation than it had a place to meet with God, a place to worship God. Roman coins were exchanged for temple shekels. Animals were sold for sacrifice at exorbitant rates. 
And money was being made hand over fist for the religious leaders and the the little power brokers that were involved with the temple. Jesus had cleansed the temple earlier on at the front end of his ministry. But things really hadn't changed much as he comes back in another time here towards the end of his ministry. Jesus is Oscar Mike. He's on the move to right the wrongs that he's witnessing in his father's house. The merchants, they they weren't trying to bring the people closer to God. In fact, they were making things harder for people to come to God. They were setting up barriers between God and between the people. And so Jesus sets about turning over tables and benches, driving out merchants, setting the stage for Jesus to come in and begin to teach the people in the temple. Setting the stage, setting the stage for the barrier between God and man to be lifted, to be ripped from top to bottom. On Tuesday, Jesus moves into that clean temple. And essentially, he sets up shop in the temple and began to teach the people. The religious leaders use this as a way to test Jesus, sort of a a way to stump the chump, so to speak. And so what begins to happen uh, is a series of what is called the temple debates. The religious leaders tried to trap Jesus by asking silly questions. Questions like, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Crazy questions about marriage and the afterlife and who, you know, who's married to whom and which commandment is the greatest. And after they had run out of goofy questions, Jesus silenced them all and he asked them a question that they either could not answer or would not answer. And since no one could match the wisdom of Jesus, they all kind of just gave up. Asking him questions. In fact, Matthew chapter 22, verse 46, just simply says this. No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Jesus was making the religious ruling class look silly. All they wanted, they just simply wanted Jesus to go away. To be gone. But then, in the midst of all this going on in the temple... Jesus peers into the hearts of these religious leaders, of the people that are there trying to trap him, and he delivers powerful indictments upon them. It's what the Bible calls seven woes. And so Jesus, one after another, almost like a fire hose or a waterfall of all these indictments just coming upon the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And this is what Jesus said, Woe to you! Woe to you, you teachers of the law and you Pharisees! You hypocrites and he begins to call down upon them all call them on on all their sinfulness and on all their duplicity that they had but in some ways when we think about it when we kind of read it from the passage we also realize that they weren't really the only ones in the room and in some way in some ways i was in the room in some ways all of us were in the room as well You see, in just a few more days, Jesus would be Oscar Mike. He would be on the move toward the cross. And not only would he die for the religious leaders and the Pharisees and everybody in that room that would literally put him up on the cross, but he would die for all of us, for all of my sins and all of my hypocrisies, for all of your sins and all of your hypocrisies. He would die for all of us. And what's interesting and what's telling about Jesus is at the very end of those seven woes, as he is delivering all of these indictments against them, and they really can't stand against them. I mean, it's just one after another after another with all this truthfulness. At the end of it all, Jesus gives us a quick peek into his heart and into his grace and into his love when he says this. He says, Jerusalem Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. You see, Jesus was on the move, not only for you and me, 
not only for all of us here in the room or watching online or out in the parking lot, he was on the move for all those that would set themselves up as enemies, direct enemies of his that were actually in that room, that would be calling for his crucifixion in just a few days. Jesus was on the move to die for their sins too. How incredible is that? As Wednesday rolls around, something shocking takes place. Even to this day, scholars and Bible experts shake their heads at this. We, we come up with, with, with reasons why, but we really don't know. But it's on this day that Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' own disciples, agrees to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver for the price of a slave. And no one really knows why. I mean, quite frankly, we just really don't know the motivation behind of things. Was it greed? Maybe. Was it disillusionment with Jesus and the cause that he thought Jesus was behind? I don't know. Was it just anger because of what Jesus had just done in, at the dinner party and called him out uh, in the middle of, in front of everybody? No one really knows. But whatever it was, we can boil it down to Judas's own selfishness and his sin that was clearly in his heart. And so for 30 pieces of silver, for 30 silver coins, Judas watched and he waited for a time, the right time, to hand Jesus over to his enemies. And what's more, Jesus knew it. Jesus knew. But still, he was undetoured. He didn't, he didn't change his plans. Jesus was determined. Still, Jesus was on the move. He was Oscar Mike towards that cross and that empty tomb. And wanting to eat one more Passover meal with his disciples, he sent the rest of them to make arrangements for an early Passover meal. And so while Judas is betraying, the other disciples are preparing. And we are told in Matthew chapter 26, verse 17 through 19, that on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And he replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, listen to this, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. And so the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Things are set in motion. Events begin to move at rocket speed. For a while, you could see Jesus walking to the cross and the empty tomb. And then you see him jogging to the cross and the empty tomb. At this point in time, he begins to sprint towards that cross and empty tomb. It's not long now. You see, Jesus is running headlong to that cross for you and me. Running headlong to that empty tomb so that we could have victory. It's on Thursday that the meal is prepared. The disciples are excited. The lamb is ready. And not just the one that's roasting on the spit. Jesus the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, is ready. The disciples are unaware. The mood was different in the room. A little more solemn. Judas, the traitor, was in the room. But so was Peter, the denier. He was there as well. And Jesus, as he sits down at the table, tells them this in Luke chapter 22, verse 15 and 16. He says these incredible words. I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. Shows you how much he loved his disciples and how much he loved you and I. He goes on to say this. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And then... As the meal is being served, Jesus begins to get up and wash everyone's feet in the room, including Judas, whose wallet is a little bit more full than usual. Jesus speaks of his betrayal, Peter's denial, and the promised Holy Spirit that would come. And Jesus gives us an incredible reminder of what he's about to do when he institutes the Lord's Supper. Reminds us of his body and his blood. And somewhere in the midst of that meal, somewhere in the midst of that, Judas slips out. 
prepared to lead the religious leaders to where Jesus is going to be, or should be, where he liked to be. And then somewhere after that, Jesus and the eleven get up and they begin to move. They begin to be on the move towards the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is Oscar Mike to the base of the Mount of Olives. While they're there, the disciples sleep. Jesus prays and Judas leads. He betrays Jesus with a kiss. And Jesus is now on the move towards the cross and the empty tomb with a detachment of over 200 soldiers around him, arresting him, leading him. It's early Friday morning. Jesus is put on trial. Fingers are pointed. Faces are angry. Jesus is slapped, questioned, lied about. But more importantly, and maybe even more surprising, Jesus is silent. He is silent. Fulfilling Isaiah 53, 7. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. You see, this was supposed to be our trial. People were supposed to be pointing fingers at us because of our sin. But Jesus took our punishment. He took our sins upon himself. And so while Pilate is washing his hands, Jesus is led away to be crucified on our cross for my sin. Jesus is Oscar Mike up the Via Della Rosa. The cross beam is heavy and he can't carry it. They pull someone out of the crowd, Simon of Cyrene, to carry it the rest of the way. And on Good Friday, not good for Jesus, but good for us, on Good Friday, Jesus is nailed to the cross. And he pays for our sins in full. To tell us die, he says. It is finished. The debt has been paid. Your debt. My debt, my sin has been paid for. To tell us die. Jesus is dead. Blood and water flow from his side. Part of his mission has been completed. There's an earthquake. And the veil in the temple that separated God from man is torn in two from top to bottom. Not bottom to top, but top to bottom. And Matthew records, of all things, the only one to ever record this, Matthew records that at that moment that Jesus died and that earthquake happened, that there was a resurrection of dead people that, came, that just came to life. It says that tombs broke open and people came to life and went walking in to the city, walking into Jerusalem, and they appeared to many, many different people. And as all this is going on, the one person that was able to consume all of it and probably has the best line of the entire passage there in Matthew 27 is a centurion. Matthew 27, verse 54, he says this, Surely he was the Son of God. Pretty perceptive. Jesus was on the move. He was Oscar Mike for you and for me. But the story doesn't stop there. Saturday night, yes, there is questions. Saturday night, there is pain. Saturday night, there is disillusionment with what just took place. But it's Sunday. On Sunday, a day much like today, Jesus rose from the grave. Death couldn't hold him. Death couldn't stop him. Jesus was Oscar Mike once again and walked out of the tomb fully alive fully alive sin sin had been defeated on a friday and death had been defeated on a sunday and the angels at the tomb declare in in luke chapter 24 verses 5 and 6 they say why do you look for the living among the dead he is not here he has risen he has risen You see, Jesus was on the move. He was Oscar Mike for you and for me. Not just to the cross. Not just to the cross. 
but to that empty, borrowed tomb. Throughout history, Jesus has been on the move for you and for me. Jesus has been, whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, Jesus has been on the move for you. But not just for you, for your friends, for your family, for your classmates, for your co-workers, for everyone that you rub elbows with. Jesus ran to the cross, walked out of the tomb, and somewhere along the way, and, and from that event 2,000 years ago, somewhere along the way, someone was Oscar Mike to you and walked up to you and told you about the resurrection of Jesus. Somewhere along the way, someone shared with you the simple gospel message. That message has not been broken from that event. 2,000 years ago where people are saying, no, listen, I saw Jesus raised from the dead. I watched him. I saw him. I heard him. I was in his presence. I can tell you for a matter of fact that Jesus is alive. From all the way back then to now, that message has not been broken. The message of the good news of the resurrection of Jesus has been given to us today. And if you have never heard that before, if you're online and you've never heard that before, welcome to the club. Now you have. Now you have. That is the gospel. Someone was Oscar Mike for you and me and share with us the gospel message. Question is, what would it look like? Think about this for a second. Dream with me just a bit. What would it look like if we were Oscar Mike with the simple gospel message for someone else? What would that look like? What would it look like if, as a church, we were on the move with the simple gospel message? What would it look like if our message to our friends and neighbors and coworkers and classmates and everybody that we rub elbows with was the same as that of the angels there at the tomb? He's not there. Jesus has risen. If that message could impact first century people, could it not impact 21st century people too? Absolutely. We look around our world today, and we know it. The world's in trouble. The world is in trouble. It's in chaos. Evil is on the rise. Satan recognizes his time is short. And the church, at least here in America, in some ways seems paralyzed, if I could use that term. Our world today needs the church to be Oscar Mike, to be on the move. In fact, we were built, the church was built to be on the move. Think about this for a second. We have an unstoppable Savior. We have an unstoppable Savior who has given us an unstoppable message. And when the church is on the move, the church much like our Savior, much like our King, is unstoppable. I will build my church, Jesus says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Church, we need to be Oscar Mike. We need to be on the move. Now more than ever. Now more than ever. As we prepare for a time of communion, you should have had that on your chairs. If you don't, raise your hand. We'll make sure that one gets to you. But as we prepare for a time of decision and communion, we're reminded, we're reminded of the incredible power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ uh, who took our sins upon himself uh, and uh, took them to the cross. When we look at that bread, it reminds us of his body. And what he did for us in the body. And when we see the cup, it reminds us of his blood that was poured out for us. That blood that washes away our sins. And so today, as you partake of these emblems, as you partake of these emblems, and you are reminded of what Jesus has done, and you think about that, also, would you do this as you spend some time with him in prayer? Would you thank him? Would you thank him for his sacrifice? for you and for all of us? Would you thank him for his great love that he has for you? Would you thank him for his resurrection power that he has for you? If God can resurrect from the dead, is there anything that he cannot do? I want you to thank him. Thank him for being Oscar Mike 
for you, for being on the move for you. Listen, he can make all things new, all things new. And our vision here at MC3 is to reach the one who is lost in our community and in our world and to teach everyone how to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Fully devoted followers of Jesus. Now, maybe some of you in the room are going, I've, I've, already, I've already accepted Christ. You know, this is my first rodeo. I've, I've been around, I've, I've seen a lot of Resurrection Sunday. So we got, a, we got something we want you to help us with. we got this new tool. We want to put it to good work and good use for ourselves. So we want you to get your phones out real quick. If you've got your cell phone, if you've got one of the modern, modern day technology cell phone things, I want you to pull that out. And I want you to text, if one of these, if you fall into one of these, I want you to text to us. Because here's the thing, some of you may have a relationship with Jesus right here, whether you're watching online or in the room. Some, though, may not. Some of you go, I've, I've never made that choice. I've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. I've never really walked down that road. I just kind of dabbled with it. And some of you may go, listen, I've got, I've got a ton more questions you know, for you before I, I, I take the deep plunge. I've got a ton of questions. Then we want to help you out with that. And you can get a response from us. Uh, just with some key words that you text. If you already have a relationship with Jesus, we want to know it. I mean, you may go, well, you know me, or you know who I am. Absolutely. But I, we, want you to, we want you to share that with us. If you'll just text uh, to this number, 833-459-0607, if you'll just text the word relationship uh, to let us know that, hey, I've already got a relationship with Christ. We just want to celebrate that. We just want to celebrate that with you. But if you go, listen, I don't, I don't have a relationship with Christ. I've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. If you'll text just the word yes, as in yes, I do need a relationship with Jesus. Yes, yes, I do need that. If you'll just text that word to us, we'll make sure that we get back to you. And if you've got questions, you're like, I'm not really sure about any of this. I'm so new to this. I've got so many questions. Then if you'll just text, text the word questions to us then we'll get back to you, and we'll take the opportunity to help answer whatever questions you might have and to help you move through those things so that we can draw you closer to Jesus one step at a time. And also, too, while you're online today, there are people standing by to chat with you. If you're on our website or our app, you can just you can start chatting with somebody, uh, one of our MC3ers. They can help you uh, make those first critical steps towards Christ. And if you're in the room, I'll be right down front. I'd love to help you uh, get one step closer to Jesus. I'd love to pray with you if you need prayer today. But church, we need to be Oscar Mike because this world needs the gospel, the simple gospel message now more than ever. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace that <laughs> you so freely give to us. It just amazes me, Father, that it is free, that you just hand it to us 2,000 years ago, you were on the move so that there would be no barrier between us and you. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Lord, for those in the room and online that have a relationship with you, I give you praise and glory for that. That somewhere, someone stepped into their story and shared the message of the resurrection with them. Father, for those that may not have had that opportunity yet, that may not have had someone step into their story, Lord, I pray you'd help us to do that. Lord, for those that, that we know, whether they're family members or co-workers or whoever it might be, for those that we know that don't know you, Father, I pray you'd help us to be able to reach them with just those simple words that Jesus has risen. And so, Father, I pray that you just bless us, Lord, as we strive, as we strive to reach the one that's lost in our community, in our world. And I pray, Lord God, as, as, as a church, Lord, that we'd be on the move, that we wouldn't get stuck in the mud, that we wouldn't just get mired down by our own selfishness and get mired down by things that don't matter, but yet, Lord God, that we would be on the move so that we might impact lives and might bring you glory. And so, Father God, we pray that today, Lord, that if someone in the room or online needs you, that you would lead them, Lord God, in that, that they would, they would find the right person, ask the right question, and for those, Lord God, that, that already know you, Father, I pray you continue to draw us closer and closer to you and use us, Lord God, in ministry. We thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your resurrection. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.